Hey, thanks so much for tuning in to Faith Community Online, wherever you're at today. As you listen to the message, let us know what you think in the comments, like if something stands out to you, if something inspires you or even challenges you, we would love to hear about it. At the end of the message, there will be a few details about how you can connect at Faith Community and take your next steps on your own personal journey with God. Thanks so much for being here. Now let's dive in. This morning, we are going to be jumping back into a series that we started at the beginning of the year. Does anybody even remember the beginning of the year? Right? We jumped into the book of Ephesians, and we finished the first three chapters of Ephesians right before we went into quarantine and were recording messages from home. And I just felt, uh, for whatever reason, to take a pause from Ephesians and preach through some different things. And I want to come back and start chapter four today. Now, I wrote this message, or better yet, Paul wrote this content in Ephesians many, many years ago. But I, I formulated some thoughts and put this message together right before we went into quarantine. So it's kind of just been sitting there and sitting in my computer and kind of in my heart. And I think the timing is so appropriate. It's so amazing to me that regardless of the time frame and the context in which Scripture was written, its ability to be applicable and relevant to the situations that we find ourselves in today, right? And this message today is very timely. Now, just to bring us up to speed, Book of Ephesians has six chapters. Paul wrote it from prison. He was in prison because he was preaching the gospel, and he was, he was going against the establishment, and they imprisoned him for what he was doing. So he writes to this church at Ephesus. And the book of Ephesians can be divided in two parts, one through three, four through six. One through three is God's calling. It is all about who we are, our identity as God's people, what God has done for us in the person of Jesus, and the call to follow him, to be engaged with what he's doing and engaged with the life that he's given and created us to live. Four through six is our walk. So God calls, we walk. It is the practical side of the book of Ephesians. One through three, more doctrinal, more theological, things to try to wrap your heart and mind around. Four through six, you can get your hands around, and it's very practical. It's easy to understand, but it's much harder to put into practice. But we have to remember this. There would be no four through six without the empowerment to live the life that we discover in one through three. We can't forsake all that Paul wrote to us and to the church about who we are in Christ, what he's done for us, and our calling together as God's people. Okay, verse, Chapter 4, verse 1 has been our theme for the entire series, and we're going to pick that up. So I know you probably all remember the first three chapters, but if you don't, you need to read it again, and you can go online and you can get caught up to any of the messages that we had at the beginning of the year as we preached the first three chapters. So today, I want you to go with me to Ephesians 4. We're going to look at verses 1 through 6, beginning on the walking portion of what it means to be a Christ follower, the practical application, walking it out day in, day out. Paul says, therefore... And I'm so glad he says, therefore, because in order to say, therefore, there has to be something there for which to him to refer to, right? He's referring to everything in chapters one through three, all right? God's calling, your identity, who you are in Christ. And on the basis of everything he's just said, here's a call to action. Therefore, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. He's begging, he's pleading, he's imploring us to live in the empowerment that God has given us. I beg you. He said, now always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourself united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. For there is one body and one spirit, just as you've been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God and Father of all, who is over all, in all, and living through all. He uses the word one there seven times, which is the number for divine perfection. This sense that we are all unified with one purpose, with one mission, our diversity and our differences included and celebrated, but we are united just as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are united into the the Trinity and are unified in mission and in purpose and in essence that we too 
Regardless of any factor, any qualifying factor, any, any factor that we would use to a, a explain who we are, we're united as God's people into one. And Paul, at the beginning, is saying, I beg you to lead a life, to live a life worthy of your calling. Now, I think it's important to define calling. Now, we don't often use the word calling a lot. What we say is someone says, hey, uh, hello, I'm Josh. How, how are you? Who are you? And you give me your name. And, and we know that in conversation, what's going to follow ultimately is, what do you do? Right? And then we go into a discussion about our job. And we use a phrase such as, I am. Not so much I do, but I am. And we start to define ourselves on the basis of our job. We find identity in what we do. I am a pastor. I am a teacher. I am a contractor. I am a business owner. I am, I am. And we have this misunderstanding that we are what we do, but we're not. That a job is very different than a calling. Because the word calling, if you grew up in church, was used almost exclusively, unintentionally to say, you are called if you're a pastor. You are called if you're a worship leader. You are called if you're a missionary. Like there's only a few offices with which you can actually be called to, and everybody else is just what? Not called? It's a misuse and misunderstanding of the word calling. I want to submit to you today that every single one of you in here is called. You have a calling. God is calling you. He has called you. He will continue calling you for the rest of your life. Because a call is really an invitation. All of Scripture, and specifically what we're reading today, is a calling from God. It is an invitation to follow Him. Because we are called to God first, we are not called to activity. We are called to a person. The activity with which we do is an outflowing of the understanding that I'm called to him. My job is an outflow of my call to God. We are called to God before we're called to a location. I function as a pastor, but I am a follower of God. I am a child of God who happens to be a pastor. You are children and followers of God who happen to be doing a particular job. You are not what you do. It's important to understand that because activity will change. Jobs may change. The calling of God never changes because we're called to him and we follow him. It's an invitation. It's a voice calling out to us. God saying, come, come. Remember what Jesus said, come to me, all who are burdened and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He didn't say, come to this job that I have for you. Come to me, and as you discover who you are, go and do what I've put in your heart to do. What if God cares less about your job and far more about who you are? I've struggled with that. I'm a pastor. No, this is my current activity and current uh, expression of me being called to God. Listen to what Eugene Peterson says about a calling. He said, it gives us a destination. It determines what we do. It shapes our behavior and it forms a coherent life. That when we, we have a calling, the seemingly disparate parts of our life, our job, our family, our finances, our vacation, we have all these, these uh, quadrants, right? that we divide everything into. And what God is saying, there's a calling that will bring co a coherence, a coalescing of all those things together, and they will be an outflow and a manifestation of the understanding that we are called. Because a calling is a vocation. And a vocation is different than a job. Here's how we can define a job. A job is an assigned piece of work, and when the work is done, the job is over, and we go back to just being ourselves. How many people retire or move from one job to the other and fundamentally don't know who they are? Because they can't walk back into the same office with the people who know them, and they're not sitting at the desk, and they're not doing things that they used to do. They were so ingrained in what they did as their identity that when that is gone, they don't know who they are. 
A job is an assignment. A vocation is a way of life. Think about it this. It's, it's like purpose, understanding your purpose. The, the mission and the purpose of this church is to help you move from where you're at to where God wants you to be. The methods through which we accomplish that may change. Not may, they will, and they do, and they have to. The mission stays the same. We're called to the mission. We rediscover how to accomplish the mission. You have a mission and a purpose and a calling for your life, and at some stage that might have been X, but now it's Y. And do you understand the mission and the calling? Are you so focused on a job? It's important to understand. The word called is this word ekklesia in the Greek. And it literally means to be called out. Here, listen to this. In Greek, it means an assembly or a gathering of people who've been called together in a designated place. It's the word used in the scriptures for church. We are the ecclesia, the called, gathered community of God. Not just today because we're in the same room, but because we're the people and the family of God. All right? In the Bible, it means congregation, God's congregation, or the assembly of God's people. And this is, cannot be the ultimate definition of church where the one time a week we come together and sit and listen to someone sing and someone preach and we engage a little bit. This is not ecclesia. This is a form, a part, a sliver of what it means to be God's people. But we're the ecclesia of God, the called people of God every day in every context that we find ourselves in. That's what we have to understand, that God's mission is our mission, and I play it out as a pastor, and you play it out as a business person, and you play it out as a teacher, and you play it out as a contractor, or whatever the case may be, but we are called, and the, the method may change, but we are not primarily individualistic. We are individuals. We do have gifts and talents, and we're unique, and we're diverse, but all that comes together because we're called together. And your part to play may be different than my part, but neither one of our parts are more important than each other. The, the individual pieces are not greater than the sum total of all of us called together. And Paul is saying, I want you to live a life worthy of this, that you may understand your destination. You may understand what you're working towards, to whom you are living for and being called to. I was watching a, a, Lauren and I were actually watching it on Netflix, this, this show about this actor who was, uh, was trying to travel the world and find some sense of purpose and meaning, and he made this statement. He's rather successful. He goes, well, the thing that really got me was uh, I started to understand that I'm living a life of success with no purpose. A life of success with no purpose. And he said it's empty and it's isolating. See, we, we are all about achievement, aren't we? We're all about succeed, 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 achieve, 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 get stuff, get stuff, get stuff. And we achieve and we succeed and we get stuff and we still don't know who we are because it's never enough. Has anybody in here made enough money <laughs> to the point where someone asks you, do you want some more? You're like, eh, I don't know. <laughs> no, I'll take it. You don't want it. I'll take it. After a while, the accumulation of stuff and money with no purpose what do you do? You become empty. It doesn't mean anything. How, how do we take this desire to accomplish and conquer and succeed, which I think comes from God, and realize that it has to be dovetailed in and a part of the ultimate mission that God has, and that we do it together with this calling, and that our jobs may change? So maybe just a tweak we could all make. When someone says, so what do you do? You don't say, I am. You say, my current job is this, because you are not what you do. How many millions of people in this pandemic who lost their job, lost their identity? Like that. But our hope and our sense of value and worth and identity can never be found in what we do. It is found in the one who found us and is calling us and who gives us a hope that is beyond what this world has to offer. My hope for myself and for you is we will not define ourselves by what we have and what we do, but by who we are in Christ. You want to say two words that sum up the first three chapters of Ephesians? In Christ, in Christ, in Christ. 
so that when we get to four, five, and six about what we do, we do it in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. And then we're not doing things to belong. We're not doing things to be better. We're not doing things to try to impress God. We're doing them because we found that it is by grace through faith, not by works, lest anybody should boast. Right? That's the call. Now, Paul is saying, not only are you called, it's time to walk. It's time to start living. It's time to grow up because Ephesians is all about maturity. It's all about growing up and being mature and saying, here's everything that I've done. Now stand up on two feet and start living it. Because here's what he says. He he lists four things, four things that describe a life worthy of our calling, four characteristics that are going to be easy to understand but hard to implement and maybe a bit offensive and getting up in our grill. And it's timely for right now. Listen, the first thing is, he said, always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourself united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. The first thing he says, be humble and gentle. But he uses a word, always. What does always mean? Always. (laughs) In every situation, with every person you come across, always be humble and gentle. It starts within the family of God, and then it extends outward. Here's what that means. Not a pushy desire to defend our own rights and advance our own agenda. And it means that we can be happy and content when we are not in control or steering things our way. Whoo! Think about that. When's the last time you felt comfortable having a conversation with somebody who you didn't think agreed with you on a particular issue and you thought, you know, this is going to be wonderful. (laughs) We're going to be able to sit down and talk as two human beings. No. We know that when we sit down, an agenda is going to be at play. And we are going to try to evangelize the other person. And I'm going to try to convert you and get you to say my version of the sinner's prayer so you agree with me. Because I'm right. And you're wrong. And I knew I was right before we sat down and talked. It's become an echo chamber. We want to be right. Why? Because we don't know what's going on anymore. And feeling like we're right makes us feel better. And we want to be in control. We're not. And Paul's saying, he wrote this how long ago? Like a long time ago. Like at least a thousand years ago. How timely is this? He's saying, hey, first to the body of Christ, hey, when you guys sit down with one another, be humble and gentle. Don't try to push your own agenda. Don't try to preserve your own rights. Be open. Don't try to be in control. Don't try to steer things your way. Have empathy. Have compassion. Be humble and gentle. Now, this doesn't mean that we stop standing up for truth and all that good stuff. There's a time and a place for that. But, but we, 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 we're doing that all the time. Right? I mean, that's what we see the evidence of what's in our hearts by the way people treat one another on social media. It's all about being right. And it's horrible. Could we stop trying to be right and just do what's right? What a novel thought. Stop trying to be right and act right. And act what this says. And live it. I can guarantee you, your pushy, and not my, I don't have a your in here, all right? This is, the, this is the universal your. Your pushy agenda to be right is converting no one. Jesus didn't come to be right. He came to do what was right. And he often did what was right before he told somebody who he was all about and what he wanted to do. He met the need. He met the need. And that's so important, being humble and gentle. Now, think about this. Think about this in terms of if you're married in your own marriage. What if you could be humble and gentle? What if you could sit down with your spouse and not have to be right and push your own agenda? My spouse, if. If they would only. If you. Now, there are extenuating circumstances. I'm not talking about in cases of abuse and things like that. What if we could practice at home first? I gotta, if I ain't unified with my spouse, then I ain't unified with nobody. Well, at least I shouldn't be. Our interpersonal relationships, mothers to fathers and to sons and sons and, and, and fathers and mothers and all that kind of thing, and, and, and our friendships and in our family and in, in our interpersonal relationships, what if we just started to be humble and gentle and didn't have to be right? 
man, what could that change? I'm not asking you to go out into the culture and change the whole political scene because we can't, but I do think it starts with one person at a time, each conversation, each relationship at a time. Because Paul takes it to another level when he says this. He says, be patient and make allowance for faults. Be patient and make allowance for faults. And what if we could just see this as grace? Unearned, unmerited favor, where we start from a posture of grace and we don't assume you're bad and we don't assume everything you say has some uh, premeditated motive behind it that is, is aimed at offending and destroying us. What if we just make room for our faults of other people. I think it's difficult at times to make room for others' faults because we have no room for our own. Right? And it's really easy for me to see what your problem is and tell you how to deal with your problems because I can then avoid my own problems. What about looking in the mirror and asking God, well, you know, thank you that, that you didn't disown me when you saw my faults. Thank you that you weren't pushy. Thank you that you were gentle and humble and you came and gave Jesus Christ to me. That we, if we want to give grace, we have to receive grace. And here's how we can define this. It's long-suffering. Being long-suffering with people. Like It is the spirit that has the power to take revenge, but it never does. It is a characteristic of a forgiving and generous heart. So he's saying it's how we need to treat one another. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. I heard a podcast the other day, and uh, the guy was talking to him, and he said, you know, I'm just really trying to be less wrong. And I, I thought it was a good phrase. He didn't say, I'm trying to be more right. He said, I'm trying to be less wrong in my approach, which I just sensed there was a humility there, not a justification for being wrong, but I'm, tr I'm trying to be less wrong, not more right. Because in acknowledging that we are wrong, there's humility there. But an attempt to just be right, what do we gain from being right? Do we feel better? Do we, do we is, is it, and I'm not saying this is true for you, but sometimes being right is way easier than doing what's right. I, I took a stand. I shared it. I posted it. I told them it's what God said. Did it, did it work? What, what if we stopped preaching at people and declaring what God said and we allowed who God is and what God has done in our life to play itself out in our behavior, which could create capacity in people to want to hear what God said. I, I think that we have somewhere along the line, again, universally, collectively, thought in this country, if we just say what's right, it'll change people's lives. But that's not what Jesus modeled. He went to where people were, and he met their needs, and he didn't require them to believe in him before he helped them. They didn't have to be a believer to be a benefactor. And sometimes, in allowing them to be a benefactor, it created the capacity and the faith and the hope in them to believe. And what if we thought that way? That we're going to be humble, we're going to be gentle. We know the truth, hopefully. You do. And, but we love people. And we want to do what's right instead of trying to be right. And maybe we could just try to be less wrong in our approach. And maybe we can make, start to make room for our own faults so that we can therefore make room for other people's faults. And we can let people be people. And you know what? This is not something we do because someone gave it to us first. We're not only humble when someone else is humble. We're not only gentle when the other person is gentle. We don't only make room when they make room. We're not only patient when they make patient, when they're patient. And, and can we just stop expecting people who don't believe in Jesus to act like this? Like people who don't believe in him, why do you think, why are you asking them to live like this? You're going to be like so frustrated all the time. That's like asking a three-year-old why are they not as mature as a 12-year-old? Because they're three. Right? And if our expectations could be different, and we could do what's right and not try to be right. He then goes on to say this. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit. And here's the thing. He says make every effort to keep yourself united. We don't create this unity that we have with one another. We don't manufacture it. There's not like a secret pocket of it that we can just open. 
The unity is already present because of the finished work of Christ and the Holy Spirit who lives within us as Christ followers. Our job is to recognize that unity and partner with it, not to manufacture it. I think sometimes we just want to feel unified. What does unity feel like? I don't know. It's a lot of hard work, right? Like by grace, we have the capacity and the empowerment, but we have to work to maintain unity. We have to recognize what unifies us. It's not our political affiliation. It's not anything other than the Holy Spirit at work within us that we're brothers and sisters in Christ and we're different and we're unique and we're diverse and all that needs to be celebrated. We're not asking for uniformity. We're asking for unity and we contend for it. The prayer that Jesus said had, may they be one as you and I are one. But it's not just going to go, and we're going to be unified. We have to have empathy. We have to have compassion. We have to be humble and gentle and patient and make room for one another's faults and fight and contend for unity and not get sucked into partisanship and all this ridiculous stuff that's dividing the country right now. We should not be playing into it. We should not be. You know, my mom used to tell me, Josh, if you've got nothing nice to say, then... What if we could do that on social media and, and just in general? If you ain't no, nothing nice to say, then get off. If you got nothing nice to type or share or emoji click, then don't do it at all. Don't do it at all. What if we collectively just took a break? I know I've been saying this. You're like, do you hate social media? No. It's a tool. But we get sucked in. We get sucked in and inundated with the incessant, incessant, constant, permanent vitriol. And I can guarantee you, as Christ followers, we are not going to change anybody's life or mind by a post. It is not going to happen. I don't care how much scripture you put on there. Scripture's great. It's wonderful. It is about being his people and living a life worthy of the call. It's getting your hands dirty. It's at some point making yourself uncomfortable and inconvenient and doing what is right. Doing what is right. That's what's going to change. As we make an effort, every effort to keep united. He said, they will know you by your love for one another. A unified front. Unity in this country is not going to come from whoever you want to be in office. That is proven. I have no hope. I'm just going to be honest. It is not their responsibility. It is God's people's responsibility to be a voice of truth, a voice of reason, and a voice of unity. You can be mad. You can be frustrated. All that good stuff. But don't let it supersede who you are in Christ. And that we are people of unity, of truth, of reconciliation, and redemption. That God has chosen to Use us to be the givers or manifestors of those things. We are the agents of reconciliation. As Paul would say, the ministers of reconciliation in this world. So make every effort to recognize that which unifies us. If there were 10 people in a room who came from different scenarios and sectors, and they all came to the table, the first thing that would need to happen is what unifies us around this table? What is the one common thread that brings us all together? Now let's work to strengthen that. And that's what we need to do. Recognize and acknowledge and keep working on and building on what unifies us, and that is the Holy Spirit, and that is what we believe, what we hold to be true. And then he concludes it by saying this, this last characteristic. Aren't these easy to understand but hard to do? Yep. Binding yourselves together with peace. Binding yourselves together with peace. I love that phrase. The word binding has in the original language this, this image of a ligament. Now, I'm not truly uh, you know, a doctor and fully understand how ligaments work, but I know they hold things together and they're flexible, right? And, and it's in their ability to be flexible and not rigid that maintains tension in the body, Right? And, and think about kind of like a rubber band that keeps tension, but it has an ability to flex and return, to flex and return. And he's saying make every, uh, uh, every uh, 
effort to be binding yourselves together with peace. That we need to be like a ligament or like a, like a rubber band. There's like a rubber band of the Holy Spirit that is keeping us all together and we flex and we go different directions at times and our diversity and our uniqueness and our skill sets may, may go a bit different directions, but it's that binding of the Spirit, binding, calling of the mission that's keeping us together and it flexes, but it returns. It flexes, but it returns. It's flexible, not rigid. And we need to be flexible with people and not rigid. We gotta have the ability to flex, that our capacity at times needs to get bigger, so that we can bring more people in and not push more people out. That we can allow you to be a benefactor before you belong. Binding with peace. What does peace mean? It means tranquility. It means harmony. It means security and safety and prosperity. In a theological sense, it's the tranquil state of the soul assured of its state and standing before God because of the finished work of Jesus Christ. That we are accepted and beloved because of his finished work, not because of our own works, right? It's that peace that passes and transcends understanding and guards our heart and mind in Christ Jesus. That's the peace that the wall of hostility has been broken down. It's the peace that we have. Bind yourselves together in that peace. It's a choice. It takes action. It takes intentionality. It's not just a feeling that comes over us. It is, think of it like this. It's like God put money in a bank account. Now, this is not a health and wealth sermon, okay? But just go with my analogy. He put money in a bank account for you and said, everything you need is there. Here's the debit card. Here's everything you need to access it. But unless you access it, you will not live with it. It is there. It is done. It is ready. But you have to choose to go to the ATM, put the card in, and access it, and take the money out, and spend it. That's what God does. Everything is there ready. You have to do it. And he concludes all of this, all of this, by saying, for there is one body and one spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God and Father of all who is over all and in all and living through all. Seven times he uses the word one, divine perfection. That all that God is and all that God does is unified and together and it is who he is. And God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit are unique and diverse. They have the same essence, but they have different function. And yet they exist in this beautiful relationship. And that is what he wanted for us, that we would be one as he is one. It is the empowerment that we have to do that. But it is the mission. It is the mission that keeps us focused. And that mission plays itself out in the context of your life because you are called. You are called. Don't ever forget it. You have a calling. So when you leave here today and you go back to your homes and you go back to your mess and you go back to your stress and you go back to whatever you have, you are called. And now you need to do, make every effort to be humble and gentle, long-suffering, be in unity, bind yourself together with peace, knowing that there is one, one, one. There's unity. There's diversity. There's difference, but it all comes together in him, one. There's purpose, there's meaning, there's the destination, there's the, the coherence of life. It's all one, but we have to accept that calling on our life. The book of Ephesians is, is about maturity, and I've been saying this, and I really believe it. This is an opportunity in this season of our lives, in this moment in time, where I think God is saying to the church, it's time for you to grow up. It's time for you to stand up and be my people and stop thinking that just because you came and you sat in a church on Sunday, that that is all that I have for you. Stop thinking that you can separate your Monday through Saturday, Saturday from Sunday. No, this is all combined. It is holistic. It is not separate. It is not a dichotomization or a separating of our lives. I don't have a Sunday life and a week life. No, I have, I have my life, and God wants to be involved in every part of my life because it's all connected. It's one. It's time to grow up. It's almost like if you've got a 25-year-old kid at home, you've got to go in that basement, and you say, I've done everything I can do, and pow, go out there and live. 
And please don't be offended if you have an extenuating circumstance. I'm not talking about that, okay? Sometimes the difficult things that God says and does, it's because he loves us and he's saying, grow up, stand up, be the people that I've called and empowered you to be. And could I say, stop whining and stop crying and start doing what's right. So doing what's right, being God's people, going back to saying, God, this is what your word says. This is who you are, and we want to uphold this as truth and not our preference and not our opinion. I kind of feel like, and I'm, I'm going to close. I lost my timer, so I don't even know how much time I have. I'm going to close. I kind of see Paul's statement as, I beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling. And this is my context. I always use sports because that's what I grew up with. As the coach standing before you, First game's ready to happen, and he's saying, we have prepared, we have worked hard, you know what you need to do, we are entirely capable, and we should win this game, and I believe in you, and I am here for you, but we're only going to win if you 11 players, football, go out on that field, and each one of you does your job that is separate and important, but is part of the overall mission of the whole, as the whole. Now, go out there and do your job and win and leave it all on the field, and don't make any excuses because you're ready and you're prepared. That's kind of what I see this season as. Amidst the unknown, amidst all of this craziness, nobody knows what's going to happen. But we do know that God is in all and is through all and is sovereign and is in control. And we got to get on that field. And we got to do what he's asked us and called us to do and recognize it's our time to lead and to speak and to be the people of God. And realize this season is not about people coming to us, but us going to them, which it should have always been because that's the Great Commission. It was go, 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 not come, 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 go. And so may we, this week, look at our own context, look at our own life, start with us and where we're at and say, God, how can I be humble? How can I be patient? How can I be gentle? How can I make room for someone else's faults? How can I preserve unity? And how can I begin to bind myself together with God's people in peace? And allow him to lead us and ask the Holy Spirit to help us with that. Could you bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you for all of us here today and every person that is joining us online right now. Father, may we sense not the worry and anxiety, but the sense of urgency we have at the opportunity that we have as God's people. Help us, Lord, by the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to be kind and gentle and humble and to make room for each other's faults and to preserve unity and bind ourselves together in peace as you are in all and through all and for all and above all. We thank you, Lord, that, that, that you, are, you are in control. It, you, it is like, Father, we, we, we can hear your voice because you're calling. We, not be able, we may not be able to see you, but we know you're calling. And help us as a collective body of people to move towards the calling that you have for us, knowing that you never leave us nor forsake us. You are for us, not against us. You are not nervous. You are not caught off guard. You have a plan, and we trust you. And help us, Father, to live that out in our daily context and interactions. And I thank you for providing for every single one of our needs according to your riches and glory, which are in Christ Jesus. So, Father, we pray this in his name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. God bless you. You guys have a great week. We'll see you next week. Hey, thanks for joining Faith Community Online today. If you're new here or you made the decision to follow Jesus, we would love to connect with you and let you know how to take your next steps. Real quick, text NEW TO FAITH to 97000 and someone from our team will get in touch with you soon. You can also visit our website at faithcommunity.co to learn more about the church and stay in touch on social media. Shoot us a DM over on Facebook or Instagram if you have any questions. And hey, share this message with a friend. And if you have something going on in your life that you would like someone to pray with you about, please send a quick email to prayer at faithcommunity.co. Someone from our team would love to pray with you about whatever is going on in your life. 
Thanks again for tuning in. We'll see you next time.